Uh, will you be kind enough to take of questions? Of course. We have some roving microphones. Uh, somebody there at the back with that orange sweater. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> that was really refreshing and fasc fascinating. Thank you very much. Um, what was I going to say? First of all, it's interesting you mentioned um, Margaret Mead. My understanding is she, this was the same lady that went to um, certain um, places in Samoa and found there were different types of living conditions where it was the men that dressed up and were kind of um, um, the ones that were looked at and it was the women that kind of did the so-called stereotypical men work. So it's quite interesting. Um, I don't know what you think about this. As you were talking, I was wondering, do you think, because um, you said this is the Western kind of middle class thing, do you think it's actually related to the idea of adolescence and the development of adolescence? Because in some countries, they don't have adolescence. They have either you're a child or you're an adult. When you're an adult, certain things happen to you, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm wondering, because there's this kind of, this gap or this kind of hiatus between, it's getting longer and longer from what I can see, between um, being um, a kind of child type of adolescence to adulthood. I wondered if that kind of contributed to this idea of life beginning at 40. I could be wrong, but I just wondered. Thank you very much. Um, there's a couple of really nice questions there. Mead, you're absolutely right. Um, Travelled, used anthropological cultural comparisons to draw some of her conclusions. And in fact, the book Male and Female was based on a cultural comparison between the life cycle in America and in various other South Sea islands. So it was a very much a, uh, uh, a comparative study of life, cycle, uh, life cycles. What she did notice in some of that work was that there was something distinctive about the American way of living and the American lifestyle. Um, and there were other studies around this period and afterwards as well, showing that in different cultures, people age themselves in different ways. One of the Western, the dominant Western sort of paradigms of aging is we count down to death or up to death. So we mark birthdays, 10th, 20th, 30th, 40th, 50th. There's a very calendrical view of the life cycle in the West. In many other cultures, that might not be the same, that they, they measure their life course in very different ways around social events, around when they get married, around when they have children, around, around when they become grandparents, for example. A very different measure of the life course. And it was one of the things, it, it certainly came out of some of Margaret Mead's work, but also work um, on the history of the life course in Japan and family structures in different cultures. The question about adolescence is also interesting because I was talking about um, menopause and to some extent the extending of middle age. One of the interesting things again is that we tend to regard both adolescence or puberty and menopause as biologically determined. And yet if you look at the work of people like Margaret Locke, it's very clear that different cultures experience both adolescence and menopause in very, very different ways, right down to the symptomatology. In some cultures, women, for example, at menopause do not report that they have hot flashes or headaches or whatever it might be. Very different set of cultural expectations around those transitions in the life course. And that creates a certain set of expectations or the absence of expectations, meaning that the story I've told in some ways is quite distinctive to a time and a place that even the notions of adolescence or middle essence or midlife crisis can mean very different things. In most of the literature on the midlife crisis, the, the key connection to adolescence is not so much the distance between them, but that in the modern life course, the midlife crisis of parents tends to coincide with the adolescence of children. And it's that temporal coincidence that partly triggers the midlife crisis. It may also, of course, trigger the adolescent crisis. Thanks very much. Um, we've just had Deaf Awareness Week. I want to mention something about deafness. About 20-odd uh, years ago, I wouldn't be able to come to your lecture because I wouldn't be able to follow it. Yep. This has been going on for 20 years slowly. And it's a very big thing. In other words, it's improving my quality of life. So that's a good thing. Um, but my puzzle is when people put two words together can you give me an idea but they make sense and that is the male menopause yeah. yep um, 
No, no, that's lovely. I mean, the first point is a really interesting one because you're absolutely right that our experiences of aging have been transformed quite distinctly, partly because of scientific and technological changes. And that does shape our experiences and expectations as well. That's a really nice point. The male menopause is really interesting. The, the notion of a male climacteric, which is what it was first called, appeared in the 19th century. And it was thought to be comparable to menopause in women. Not as obvious, not as sudden, not as drastic, not as critical, but a period when hormonal changes led to particular psychological and biological manifestations. During the course of the 20th century, that idea that men went through a menopause or an andropause or a male menopause came and went. The general feeling now is that this describes a gradual decline in physical, sexual, emotive potency. Where you sit, where we sit, I think we have to see that as very culturally embedded as well, just as the woman's menopause in, just as women age in certain ways, men do as well. I, I think in some ways scientifically the jury is out about the male menopause. In some ways, it can be seen as comparable to, but also a rationalization of the way in which men age. Over there, please. All right, uh, thanks, that was, a, that was really interesting. I really, I really enjoyed that. Um, I was thinking about the, um, there, was a, there was a third and final series of Reggie Perrin that wasn't shown very often, where he, um, he sort of drops out completely and, and forms a commune, if I remember. Yes. It's quite a long time ago since I've seen it, but I, I was thinking about what was sort of socially acceptable, because you talked a lot about sort of keeping up with the Joneses. Yes. As the sort of counterculture took hold in the 60s yes. and 70s, did the idea of just dropping out completely and saying, I reject yeah. everything uh, become, more, become more potent? Yeah, that's a, I mean, that's a really nice point as well. I mean, you have to understand that the Reggie Perrin story, I mean, you're right, there was, some, there was a Christmas episode and there are some subsequent <laughs> stories um, that were actually very poorly received. I think the first three series were, were fantastically popular. After that, the sense is that Nobbs and others lost the plot a little bit. Um, part of the story of Perrin in the 70s is a story about reaffirming traditional values. So when the midlife crisis emerged first and where it was discussed in the context of marriage and divorce, the narrative line was, how do you step away from, but at the same time return to your marriage? So the, 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 the story, the, the moral behind a lot of this is quite conservative. How do we um, re-embed men in the home? And in fact, of course, that's what happens to Perrin at the start. He goes off as Martin Wellborn and, in fact, goes back to his wife, who doesn't or does recognise him, and remarries him. Um, and, and actually, at one point, uh, Perrin's daughter says to his mum, you do realise <laughs> who that is. And, and his mom's, uh, her mum, uh, Elizabeth, says, yes, I know who it is, but the marriage wasn't working before and now it will. <laughs> it's the same man, but he looks different. Um, so that early series was very much about how you break away, but also reinforce the values of, of family and society. By the 1970s and 80s, by the 80s, that was beginning to break down. And you see in a lot of the literature um, a much more dramatic rejection of midlife, of, of consumer capitalist values at midlife. So um, novelists in particular are playing with this all the time. How far can I push this? What will be acceptable to the audience? in terms of what they recognise, and what is it that we're trying to destroy here or to remake. So I think in the 60s and 70s, what you get is a very conventional Perrin who goes off, has his crisis and comes back and is saved by his wife, which is a familiar narrative in most of the midlife novels. By the 80s, that's beginning to break down and people are pushing the boundaries, saying, let's reject this even further. Let's go off and travel, uh, give up my job, change partners, whatever, in a very different way. I think just one more. Would you like it? Sorry to get, sorry to get the last question. Um, I just want to say thank you very much. You've cheered, cheered me up no end. <laughs> um, I, I don't feel quite so guilty about my first divorce anymore. 
so there are all sorts of factors um, uh, yes. um, impounding my divorce, and, and it wasn't just me and um, all my mistakes. Um, so it's interesting to look at the decades and the economics and, and the warfare and all sorts of other factors that might come in to, to have um, created divorces and midlife crisis. What, what I'm interested in is, is today looking forward. So how, how do you see midlife crisis affecting us in the next decade or two? <laughs> Speaking personally. <laughs> <laughs> no. I'm well beyond the midlife crisis. I'm sure there are... Well, according to Elliot Jacks, there was a crisis at 37, midlife, and there was another crisis at 60. I'm 60 in September, so maybe <laughs> I have some hope. Um, but it's a, it, it's a very interesting question, because you're absolutely right. If I'm arguing that the midlife crisis is the product of a particular time and a place, then that time changes as well. That standardised life course that created the conditions for Reggie Perrin to go off the rails was very culturally and historically specific. What tended to happen to the life course in the 70s and 80s is that standardised life course began to fragment. People began to marry later or not marry. They had children later, fewer children, or they didn't have children. So that idea of the standard normal family timetable began to disintegrate. Now, Far be it from me as a historian to predict the future, but of course you're absolutely right that we can expect changes both to our experiences of ageing through middle age into later life and our experiences of crises and transitions because that standard life course is beginning, did begin to break down, has already broken down. Um, I still think that we are trapped by it. I think those ideals, um, the ideals that certainly ran through my parents are still affecting us, but you're absolutely right that as there is historical and cultural change, we can expect the middle age crisis and midlife to be different. Well, I think we'll have to leave it there for time constraints, but I hope people will have a chance to talk to Professor Jackson afterwards. And it's my uh, pleasure and privilege now to present you with a medal and a scroll on behalf of the Royal Society. Should we just go over there? Thank so you, yeah, you can a, do what you like. Get a nice no, photo. Exactly. Yeah. There we go. It's, that's for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.